We just go right to the altar call. That's powerful stuff right there. Very, very exciting times. Listen, uh, we're going to be in Psalm chapter 118, 118 today. You're going to want to go ahead and go there. Now, it's been said that uh, the Psalm 117, which comes just before this, is the shortest psalm in the Bible. Shortest chapter of any book in the Bible. It consists of about two verses. On the other side of Psalm 118, you have the longest chapter in the Bible, consisting of 176 verses. But tucked away in the heart of the, the Scriptures, directly in the center of the Bible, are the two verses that we'll finish with today. In verse 8 and 9 of the book of Psalm, I'm going to want you to stand with me. We're going to do it a little different today. I want to read the last two verses for you, and then we'll study together all the way through the passage. So stand with me now, and let's go ahead and read the Word of God. In Psalm 118... Verse 8, it says this, at the center of the Bible, directly in the middle, everything else finds its outward source. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Heavenly Father, help us to understand today what this means for us. A little more. A little deeper concept of trust. That we will understand your way in every way. In Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen. Amen. Now i got to say a few things. The passage today is about giving thanks. And we're going to understand why it's so important for us to give thanks. But we have a real life opportunity to give thanks today. Bob, wave your hands so everybody can see you. Uh, I want everybody to be able to see you. Bob's a walking miracle. Uh, just a month ago, he went off to MD Anderson in Houston because he was told that the cancer that he had was probably not going to be fixed, but they won't give it a try. So he left here begging for prayer and hope. And you told me just this week on the phone uh, that they have cleared you and said that it is in remission. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, I never thought I'd be grateful. Diagnosis. The diagnosis refers to the AML leukemia, which is not curable. It's only, they can only put it in remission. And between West Florida and Houston, I ended up being diagnosed with APL, which is the only curable leukemia. And as of last Thursday, I have zero leukemia cells in my body. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, the, the song that they sang said, Make me broken. <laughs> Check for me. God did that. Uh, it's a very good thing for us to be broken in the sight of God, in need of a mighty Savior to overcome our weaknesses. And I believe that the people who wrote this passage, those who, who authored Psalm 118, there's a discussion about it in theology. I, I'm not going to get in. It could have been Hezekiah. It could have been David. Either way, it was someone writing and looking back on a situation in their life when they were in a tumultuous time or a troubled time. And because of that, later they were able to look back and say, see what God did. And they wrote the psalm in thanks to God who came and did what, what could not have been done by man. It's interesting to me how God works. He continues to work. By the way, I wanted to tell the Billings and Grounds Committee, uh, third Wednesday of this week, immediately following our church service, you guys need to be here. We are way, way moving forward. Uh, just recently having the property that we voted on uh, be signed for and agreed upon. The church is now in process of going through the process of closing and, and all of that. But God is moving mightily. We have more property. We have more growth potential. God is moving, but we have a baptistry that has a metal floor that's beginning to rust out, and we've known about that for a long time. But those grounds, this Wednesday, you're going to be talking hardcore about when to start and redo that. And so it's a big time for you to be a part of that. Now, speaking of baptisms, 
Today, as I said, the church is growing, it's moving forward. God is doing amazing things. And today, immediately following our service, uh, and whoever would like to join us, we're going to go over here across the railroad tracks, turn left on John's Road, we're going to follow it all the way down to Bryant Bridge, and we're going to baptize five people in that water. Now, they've been praying for it to not be too hot or not be too cold. I've been telling them they better pray for it to be a little bit up. Because I don't care how shallow the water is, we believe in full immersion. <laughs> I'll push them as hard as I can. They're going all the way over. Sean, some of them are going to have to be under for a long time. <laughs> all right. We're excited about that. It's going to be a great time. I've never done a river baptism before. I, I, are we supposed to hold on to them as they flow on away? Or <laughs> I've heard of dunking and dropping, but I ain't never heard of dunking and drifting. <laughs> they didn't pay me extra for this. All right, well, we're excited about that too. Exodus block party is coming up on the 11th. Listen, church, you know we're partnered with Exodus because it's a wonderful ministry and a great way to reach out to the people who are part of that ministry, our people, our family, our kids, our brothers, our nephews, nieces, uh, and so forth. But on October 11th, starting at 3 and going to about 7 p.m., they're going to be doing a harvest festival that is a welcome to the community. They just recently moved from the Crest area out here to, to Baker, but what I would like to say is the greater whole area right there below uh, Baker, and uh, they are uh, very excited. It's at Buckhorn Road. You can see the information in the bulletin, but Kyra, I'm sure you need some help from us. Is that correct? And you could use some people standing booths and just welcoming and hugging us. I, ultimately, the goal is to welcome the new community where Exodus is moving. Welcome them and say, this, this is who we are. We're a bunch of people that love people made up of churches all around you. And we want to see God move in the lives of our community. And that's what Exodus stands for. Of course, that's what the church stands for as well. And so it's a good partnership for us. I do want to mention to you the end of the month fellowship because I really enjoy that, and it helps if you all bring food that night. So let next Sunday night after the service, uh, after I'm an instant place of our evening service, is our fellowship. I like to say it's a place where we cross bridges, sit with people you don't normally get to sit with. That's not the place, by the way, to come sit down next to your best friend. You, you get that every week, you get that every day, check, done. This is a place for you to sit down with someone you don't normally get to talk to church and connect. I think the theme is... Mexican foods, one of my favorite themes, so let's get on that, uh, guys and gals, and we're going to have a blessed, blessed service. And then, Matt, I think you've got to tell us about fifth quarter. There's a lot to that, so stand up and share with us how we can help you. Um, so the fifth quarter, anybody that doesn't know, it's uh, an opportunity for students after football game to do something other than get in trouble. Um, the church hosts these events, uh, multiple churches in the community kind of take their turn, and so this Friday evening is our turn. Um, we're going to have games, things for the kids to do from 10 o'clock to midnight. Now, um, depending on when the game gets over, they might show up a little earlier than 10. But uh, we're going to feed them. We're going to have a guest speaker, Coach Ogilvy from the school, is going to come and share something more late on his heart. So I'm excited about that. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, we're going to have the students register when they get here so I can follow up with them, those that aren't attending the church and those that are attending the church somewhere else. I can pass the registration on to their youth pastor there. But, Volunteers will be much appreciated, much needed. Um, if anybody can get here about 9 o'clock or so that evening, if you plan on coming, you always let me know. Um, you can see me after the service, or my phone number is also in front of both. Um, just call me or text me. But I need a little bit of help just serving food, serving drinks, um, monitoring registration, and just monitoring, as the says, just general student activities, making sure no one goes out to the highway or, or uh, speaks off and what have you. So, uh, if anybody does want an opportunity to serve, this would be a great one just to learn about some students um, and then just be a part of God's doing the beauty for the community. Um, so I think that about covers it. Amen. Amen. This is a great way for us to reach out to the young people of our church. There will be 100, 150, 200 kids here. And uh, it's just an awesome opportunity to say hello, tell the kids we love them. Gives Coach O an opportunity, a platform to present himself as a believer in Christ in a safe environment. To which then the kids will later be able to say, hey, you know what? I remember that guy. He's the one that spoke at whole. And I'm in trouble and I need help. He's, they're going to go to him. It's a great way. So all of you, teachers and otherwise, if you come that night and help, 
Then it also says the same thing to the kids. They'll remember that you were the one serving pizza, and when they're in need, you're going to be the ones they come to. And that's what church is about. That's what community is for. Us to love into our community in every way. And so you can see uh, from just these few announcements, I didn't list the announcements because you can read, but I, I did talk about a few ministries that we've got going on that I know are going to be incredible for you. Opportunities to do and give thanks to God. It's an exciting time. I didn't even mention that we got three babies on the way. we got babies all over the church that are popping up like crazy. It's awesome. I'm personally not drinking the water anymore, but I'm just saying it's a great time to be a part of this church as God continues to grow and bless us. Now let me tell you something. The Bible tells us that when God moves mightily, we're to give thanks. I want to share with you a story. Larry Kraft writes this in his book called The Pressure's Off. On Saturday afternoon, I decided I was a big boy and I could use the bathroom without anyone's help. So I climbed the stairs, I closed and locked the door behind me. And for the next few minutes, I felt very self-sufficient. Then it was time to leave. I couldn't unlock the door, though. I tried with every ounce of my three-year-old strength, but I couldn't do it. I panicked. I felt again like a very little boy as the, as the thought went through my head. I might spend the rest of my life in this bathroom. My parents and likely the neighbors heard my desperate screams. Are you okay? Mother shouted through the door. And she couldn't open it from the outside. Did you fall? Have you hit your head? I can't unlock the door, I yelled. Get me out of here. I wasn't aware of it right then, but Dad raced down the stairs and ran to the garage and found the ladder. Hauled it to off the hooks and leaned it against the side of the house just beneath the window. With adult strength, he pried it open and then climbed into my prison walked past me, and with that same strength, turned the lock and opened the door. Thanks, Dad, I said, and I ran out to play. That's how I thought the Christian life was supposed to work, he goes on to write. God shows up. He hears my cry. Get me out of here. I want to play. And it locks the door to the blessings I desire. Sometimes he does. But I now I'm realizing the Christian life doesn't work that way. And I wonder, are any of us content with God? Do we even like Him when He doesn't open the door we most want open? Marriages struggle to heal when rebellious kids still rebel, when friends betray our business fails, when financial reverses threaten our comfortable way of life, when the prospect of terrorism looms, when the health worsens, and despite much prayer, when loneliness intensifies and depression deepens, or when ministries die. God has climbed through a small window in my dark room, but he doesn't walk by me to turn the lock I couldn't budge. Instead, he sits down on the floor and says, come sit with me. He seems to think that the climbing into the room to be with me matters more than the letting me out to play. And listen, folks, that's exactly what giving thanks is about. It's praising and proclaiming God in times when we don't have a full picture of why we went out a door that we want. I'm telling you this, you know this, I've shared this with you before. Some of you experienced this about yourselves too. But some of the best blessings of my life were the doors that God slammed closed, not flung open. As we read in this passage, Psalms chapter 1, verse 1. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. For his loving kindness is everlasting. Oh, let Israel say his loving kindness is everlasting. Let the house of Aaron say his love, his loving kindness is everlasting. Oh, let those who fear the Lord say his loving kindness is everlasting. The first thing we can do is we can give thanks for God's uh, his pre perseverance. His perseverance. Now, there's a, an interesting theological discussion that calls into a discussion the perseverance of the saints. And I think it's important for us to persevere, so I don't want to downplay that effort. But I want you to understand my stance as, as a pastor and a theologian is this. Well, I cannot persevere enough, no matter how hard I try, to get where God wants me to be. I cannot endeavor or struggle enough to get to where God wants me to be. 
And if there's even one person in this room that thinks, if I do it just right, if I plan it out just correctly, if I order my steps just right, I will get where God wants me to be. You've misunderstood the entirety of the Scriptures. God does not call us to trust in our ability. He calls us to trust in Him. Now, does God order my steps after I become a believer? Does He guide me through that process? Do I hold on to Him? Yes. But it is a journey we take together. And in those times when I get caught in that little room, God's the one that comes alongside of me in my darkest moment, in the toughest times. So we talk more and we rely more about the perseverance of our God to get to us. Just think how God did persevere for us. We're going on Wednesday nights through Joshua and Judges and, and all the times when God's people turned their back on the Lord. Even though He'd done amazing things in the journey, was over and over again showing God's preservation. Even in those times, God's people ran and turned their back on Him. God raced after them. He called them to Himself. And then He brought victory in the, in the sheer face of defeat. And God did this to remind His people that I am the Lord, your God. A God like that perseveres towards me far more than I will ever persevere towards Him. There are times in my life and probably times in the lives of everybody here where we can find ourselves in a place where we feel very unlovable. We feel like there's really not much work. I don't know for a man if there's any worse thing than feeling like there's really not much you can accomplish. It could be debilitating. It could be crushing in those times, I want to know that there's an everlasting God who's persevering through loving kindness to come to me. He did it corporately, it says in here for Israel. He did it personally for the house of Aaron. And the Bible says He will do it for all of us. God's love is overwhelming and beautiful. It's not just that. Though. Read with me verse 5. It says, From my distress I called upon the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. Can I just point out in verse 5, this is pretty cool for me at least, because I, I like to take the words that the Bible says and I, I like to understand what they mean. So it says, when I'm in distress, I called upon the Lord. And for me, I think one of the, the greatest distresses I can imagine, anybody had an MRI? Okay, I do not like that MRI too. I don't even like MRI people. Sorry, Angela. Scare me to death. If Angela doesn't do my MRI, I got, they got to drug me down. I don't like those things. And they, they tell you it might be a little tight. Well, they don't understand who I am. It's not a little tight. You got the can opener me out of there. I mean, I feel distressed. Sometimes the world comes on us like that. And for someone in here right now, it might even be sin. It's got you so bound up. You know you can't move. And do you know when that voice comes through the, the headphones and says, don't move now. I never thought about moving until you said so. <laughs> now I want to do it more than anything. I'm just saying. Distress comes upon us though. And can override who we are. The Bible says that God takes you from that situation. And it says he places you in a large room. And I don't think there's an accident there. I don't think it, it was like, uh, I don't know what to say, so I'll just say big room. I think God intended to equate to us that He was taking us from something very binding and placing us in something that is very free. Big room can be used for many things. Space is a good start for me when I feel bound up. But it can also be a place where others can join me. So even sometimes distress is caused from being alone in a situation or thinking you're the only one that's going through it. When the reality is that just about everybody in here has probably gone through or felt the same kind of things you have. The church is there for the broken, for the hurting. Verse 6 says this, The Lord is for me, I won't fear. What can man do to me? And the second point I see in this passage then 
not only that God perseveres towards me, but that I can give thanks because of His presence. You know, in that tight place, my life is so chaotic, there may not even be room for God to join me. But in a larger room where everything feels like the pressures have come off, there's room for God to come. And in His presence, in the times of, of distress, I feel His presence. This passage says we can give thanks to Him because His presence is close and near. We can also give thanks to Him in times I feel confined. I set me in a large place, open my eyes to His will. In His presence in times when I feel alone. Do you remember the story? And this passage says that He is most near Verse 7 then says this. The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore I will look with satisfaction on those who hate me. Now I don't believe for a second that this looking of satisfaction is like, a, ha, ha, I'm a Christian and you're not. I believe it's more like it doesn't matter who comes against me if God is for me. Because when they come against me, my Savior is there to deflect. I am satisfied with the protection He gives me. I'm satisfied with the comfort He gives me. I'm satisfied with the God who is and is and is. And I, I believe it reminds us in verse 7 that, that God is there in every way. And that because of that, I can be satisfied. We can give thanks for what God does. To not only persevere towards us and to be present for us, but also to preserve us. So the third point is preservation. I am thankful for His preservation. Now you think about the scriptures when Israel was crossing the desert and bread fell from the sky. Preservation was clear. You can think about Abram as he journeyed across to put his son up on a mountain to death. And God provided, or provided uh, a ram in the thicket, I should say, for him. You could think of Paul and how whenever he entered a town, God provided. Even after Damascus and him being blinded, God provided someone to share with him. He was called to go into the land of the believers, a place where he would never be accepted. God provided a guide for him who would take him in there and give him the introductions needed so his work could go on. And you sit today in a church and you may wonder, how can God use me when I feel so inadequate? And I will tell you that there was not a single Bible character that exists in the stories that we know that felt adequate to do what God called them to do. If God calls you to do something, He will equip you to do it. That is where the satisfaction comes. Look at verse 8. As we read, to begin the service, it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. There are always going to be people around you, the naysayers, who say, you know, that's not really your gift, or that's not really what you should do. There may even be some telling you, well, don't listen to them. They don't know what they're talking about. They may even be saying to you, well, you might want to try something else. But the reality is, if God has called you to it, then you had better put your trust in God because it was probably your trust in man that got you in a little bit of trouble in the first place. Adam and Eve come to mind in every generation since. When we place our trust in man, we will fail. But when we place our trust in God, I shared with you last week the story about the person who goes to the doctor who you don't know, to get a prescription that you don't understand, to go to the pharmacy that you don't know about and re receive the medicine that's not necessarily something you know. And then you come home and you do exactly what it says on a bottle written by someone you've never met and you do it without thinking. But a Bible you've been raised with, a God who has provided and guided you with people who have acknowledged and trusted alongside of you, we wonder why or if we should follow Him. And it blows my mind. God is in the preserving business 
for his people. This passage tells me if I'm exposed, he'll provide shelter for me. It is better to take refuge. I love the word refuge. It's listed all over scriptures, especially through the Psalms. It always, when referring to refuge, it talks about being in the presence of God. God is my refuge. I was thinking as I, I looked up here at the ladies singing uh, an incredible uh, foursome that sang today. They were beautiful, wonderful songs, powerful. I happen to know that because we've been here together a long time, all of them, and one of them forever, uh, in their life anyway, uh, they were terrified, every one of them, to come up here and sing in front of you. This is not something that's natural, right? No matter how many times you do it, uh, and, and what, an, what an answer to prayer. I thank you for trusting God to come up here and lead us in worship. Amazing. In a sermon shortly after the sudden death of his wife, one preacher said, I don't understand this life of ours, but still less can I comprehend how people in trouble and loss and bereavement can fling away peevishly from the Christian faith. In God's name, fling to what? Have we not lost enough without losing that too? The people in the sunshine may believe in the faith, but we in the shadow must believe it. We have nothing else. Arthur John Gossip. W.E. Vine said this, to reject God, to turn away from the light, naturally brings darkness. And today, as we understand what the psalmist, whomever wrote, intended, we can know that in our times of hurting, God has always been there. And it should provide us a definite passion to give thanks as we move forward. What am I thankful for today? A bazillion things. Not the least of which, five beautiful friends who are going to be baptized today. The joy of entering into the next step of growth in our church. The ministry opportunity of working together with some of the coolest guys in the church and working on this baptistry. The excitement over a new paint in our fellowship hall and knowing that the plan to have carpet in place for homecoming. But there's all kinds of things that range from very, very important on the scale of the world to slightly less moderate than nothing on the scale of the world. But they all mean a lot to me because they just show the pattern of my God to guidance. Now, if you're here today and you don't understand fully what giving thanks to God means, I just want to challenge you with this. When you have put your trust in other things and you look back now, for the decisions of life, good decisions to trust in those things. If not, then I want to challenge you in somewhat the same way as the Psalms, certainly in the same way as W.E. Vaughn, and say, why not give my God a chance? And you will experience a testimony the same as mine. It says, every step of my journey, God has provided. Sometimes the journey is quick. And we get the answers like Bob has gotten very soon. Sometimes the struggle's a little tougher, Melissa. We've got to hold on a little tighter. But always, God brings us through. Every time.